1 Corinthians 15, and beginning with, um, with verse 1. This morning, we celebrate and declare the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Now, brothers, and I, I remind you that, you know, sometimes the language in the New Testament appears sexist. It is not. Uh, the early Christians were not. And when Paul says brothers, Adelphos, he's also speaking to women. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. This, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as, as first importance. Paul is using a word here in the Greek, protos, which means of highest priority. And so he's giving here, in a nutshell, the highest priority of the things that he received from the Lord that he is passing on to the Corinthians. And that is that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. By that he, meant, he means that they have died physically. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and by his grace to me and his grace to me rather was not without effect no I worked harder than all of them yet not I but the grace of God that was with me whether then it is was I or they this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Let me explain what he means by that and what some were teaching and what were some were believing who had come into the congregation of the Corinthians. There was, Paul is not saying that some in Corinth were rejecting the idea of resurrection. And this is very clear. It's very clear from the text. What Paul is saying is that there were some who had come in with false teaching about the resurrection. That is that they were saying that the resurrection was real, but that it was not physical, that it wasn't bodily, but that it was a spiritual resurrection. And this is what Paul is taking to task. He is saying that this is not right. And then he continues, and I continue. In verse 14, or 13 rather, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So they believe that Christ has been raised. But he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, general resurrection of the dead, for all of us who are in Christ, then not even Christ has been raised. In verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, meaning useless, of no value. Your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. This is interesting because... This leads to something that we're going to talk about, I'm going to expand on a little bit, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the completion of the work on the cross. The work on the cross is a complete work, but it stands together with the resurrection, not apart with the resurrection. And if, if, we don't, if Christ was not raised, we're still in our sins, because the one that, who died on the cross could not cover the sacrifice for our sin. Verse 17, 
And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But, verse 20, if in, if, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would fall on this word and enliven it and cause us to understand the glory of the resurrection and to see that Christ has indeed been raised the first fruits and because he is raised and he is living, that we will also be raised imperishable. In Jesus' name, amen. We think about the resurrection from time to time. But for the, the early Christian church, the resurrection was not just something that they thought about on Sunday, on Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, as some call it. The resurrection for the early believers was more than just an occasional thought. It's, it was what they had their hope fixed on all of the time. Now, today it just doesn't seem to have the same power or centrality that it has that it had for the for the early Christian. I think one of the reasons is that we have an incorrect or an imperfect view of the age to come. We don't think that much about the age to come. And in in a way we're in fact way too focused, and I'm speaking in general terms, it doesn't apply to every believer and every Christian, but we're way too focused on this side of eternity and not enough on the other side of eternity and the age to come and the glories of the age to come. Now, a lot of people have strange views about heaven and about the age to come. In fact, uh, one fellow named Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the great German philosopher, said about heaven, all of the interesting people are missing. I don't want to be there. Mark Twain said something about heaven. He said, everything human is pathetic, The secret source of human itself is not joy but sorrow. There's no humor in heaven. Mark Twain. No humor in heaven. This is why it leads some to say that they they, they don't want to be there because they they want to be with all their friends. My friends are not going to be there. I want to have fun. A woman named Emma Goldman said, Heaven must be an awfully dull place if only the poor in spirit live there. Is that what you believe? (laughs) Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer, he said, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. He was wrong. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Heaven, the Christian heaven, the the Judeo-Christian heaven is not a place of boredom. It's not a place of humorlessness. It is a place of eternal joy. It is a place of eternal bliss. It is a, a real place. It is not filled with clouds, although there probably are clouds. And you will not be wearing a, a boring-looking white thing with a halo over your head. The Jewish and the Hebrew and the Christian idea of heaven is the recreated, restored paradise that God intended in the first place that was lost at the fall. Resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees for you and me that one day we will share in the glories of heaven and that we will reign with Christ. So what evidence is there to support the claim that Jesus rose from the dead? I'm not going to enter into a long apologetic about this at all. But what evidence is there to support that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead? You know, the best way to recognize that the New Testament is an inspired work of God and that it's actually a historical document not only inspired, but a historical document, 
is to actually read it. Is to actually read it. Because when you read it, you find out something remarkable about it. In fact, one of the most famous Jews of this century did just that. And he discovered something amazing. This is a real quotation. In 1929, Albert Einstein was, was interviewed by the Saturday Evening Post. And he was asked if he believed in the historical Jesus. And this is what Einstein replied. He said, unquestionably, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. No myth is filled with such life. He never claimed to be a Christian. We don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if any of us really know with finality. I don't think anybody in this life is capable of pronouncing that somebody will be in heaven or won't be in heaven. We don't know what's in the heart of a man except for God. But we do know that Albert Einstein was a genius. You know, it's said that after his death, his brain was removed and scientists studied it for, for years. I think his brain is probably still in a bottle somewhere. Who knows? Maybe he's thinking. But Albert Einstein read the New Testament and he, he said, he came to the conclusion that it, it was real and that it spoke of a real historical Jesus. My question to you is, what are you reading these days, genius? There was a, I, th I think he's still living, a famous uh, Orthodox Jewish scholar uh, named Pincius Lapide. He, now this man is an, is an Orthodox Jewish scholar, not a Christian. But he has a very interesting and unorthodox view of the resurrection of Yeshua. And in fact, he was at one point, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but he was the, the chairman of the Applied Linguistics Department at Israel's Bar Han University. And he said this about the resurrection. This is amazing. After studying it and reading about it in depth and analyzing it, you know, I find it remarkable how many people don't even think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and whether it was valid or not and live their lives as if he never existed and he never rose from the dead. Yet there are unbelievers or non-Christians, I wouldn't call this fellow an unbeliever, who have studied and read it more and come to the conclusions, like conclusions, remarkable conclusions like this one. I accept, he said, I'm quoting from him, the resurrection of Easter Sunday, not as an invention of the community of disciples, but as an historical event. He examined the New Testament, and he concludes that the recorded events are too rooted in history for there to be any major revisions or deceptions involved in the writing. This man is a scholar of the first order. Pincus Lapita believes that Jesus, Yeshua, remarkably, Yeshua rose from the dead. This is an incredible claim. That the most incredible claim that we make as believers is to say that Jesus rose from the dead. We become so overly familiarized with that that we lose the power of it. But if we think about it, it just it challenges us to the deepest core of our faith, our, our very ability to believe. Now, I, I want you to know, and this is what I want you to come away with this morning, is that the resurrection is, is not just something Christians make a song and dance about so they can have a really great day uh, once a year and celebrate something very wonderful and send a lot of cards and buy new clothes and wear their Sunday best? Is it relevant for you? Does it matter to you and to me? Does it really matter? I was um, searching around the, the internet. So many wonderful things that you can find now on the internet. So many good things. So many bad things too. But I was trolling around. Uh, is that a good phrase? Probably not. Trolling, no. Searching. Uh, for a, a clip to show on Good Friday. And I, you know, I found a good clip uh, that we showed on Good Friday. 
And I was just reading the remarks, and the clip was about the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it took the movie, and it, it overlaid some beautiful music. And, and then, you know, I was reading down in the remarks, you know, people always remark about videos, and, you know, they say whether they like them or not, and there, there's, always, uh, there's always a lot of interesting comments. And one, one I think, well-intentioned person remarked, and he said this, he said that in his opinion, People were overly obsessed with the passion and the crucifixion. Overly obsessed. And I, I thought about that. And, and then he said, I quote, I just took his remarks here. He said that he, quote, wasn't called to live a crucified life, but a resurrected life. And I, I thought about that, and it, it just kind of sat there. It didn't digest very well. There's something wrong with that. I'm not called to live a crucified life, but a resurrected life. And then it came to mind on Good Friday as um, Will Tartak was reading a verse of Scripture. If he would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it dawned on me why there was something that just didn't add up. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, actually in verse... Verse 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and I'm going to read down to, to verse 12. Paul is talking about the treasure of the gospel that he defines as the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And he says about this treasure in verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. The jar of clay in inference to our natural human body. We are jars of clay, fragile. But we have that treasure of the glory of Christ in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then he goes on to speak of his experience as an apostle, as a servant of Jesus. Verse 8, he says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed because of this glory that remains. You know, the the jar of clay may take a little beating and may experience some weathering and aging and cracking, but but the glory of Christ remains. It's not crushed. Uh, We're perplexed. We're confused. Sometimes we don't understand what on earth God is up to. I had a week like that. Maybe you did too. We're perplexed, but not abandoned. We're we're struck down. Sometimes those jars of clay can fall and shatter, but we're not destroyed. And then he said, look at at verse 10. He said, we always, would you say with me always? always? We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like the crucified life. We always carry about with us the death of Jesus. Maybe you're feeling like that these days. But it doesn't stop there. He says this, that this is necessary so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we, now notice this, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. You see that there? The cross, the empty tomb. The cross, the death of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're carrying those two things around always. Now this is something I want, I want you to get a hold of because I've talked about this often in reference to the cross of Jesus Christ. The, co- the cross of Jesus Christ was a kingdom inbreaking event. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. When Jesus died, you remember all the remarkable events that surrounded the crucifixion. Remember what happened? The sky grew dark you know, at midday, in the middle of the day, there was, there was an earthquake. There were these powerful manifestations. An earthquake occurred that shook most of the, 
the, in fact, some, uh, some who have studied this think it was a worldwide earthquake that it was, was felt, and there's indications and in, in writings that, that seem to point to that. It was felt as far away as Rome. The skies grew dark. The powers of the age to come had broken into that moment when the Son of God hung on the cross. Now, when you read the, the, these signs and wonders and events that occurred at the cross, you read those things, right away you think, this is just like the things that we see in the book of Revelation. Power for earthquakes, the moon you know, turning to blood, the sun growing dark. All of the things, in fact, that you see related at the end of the age break in at the cross. Now, this is really significant. And if you can get a hold of this, you can understand really the core of what we call kingdom theology. Because when we come to faith in Jesus, when you say today, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and you say that from your heart, the powers of the age to come, of the future, the things that are going to happen at the age to come, come breaking into your life now. In fact, when you believe in Jesus, you experience with finality the judgment that will happen, the general judgment that's going to happen at the end of the age. And the verdict is that you are pronounced innocent because Jesus bore your guilt and your shame and all of your sin on the cross. Now, let me show you this. I I really kind of want to dig into this a little bit more than I did in the first service because you guys have already eaten and and uh, you, you're, you're well fed and, and all that kind of stuff, right? You're not hungry. Manna from heaven, come. <laughs> the cross of Jesus Christ is an ahead of time judgment that will be experienced in fullness at the end of the age, but not for the believer. The believer has his judgment at Calvary. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is also an ahead of time event because the general general resurrection, the Jew was very clear on on the resurrection. It would happen at the end of the age and all of the righteous would be raised at the end of the age. But something happens. Instead of a one stage resurrection, what God had in mind was a two stage resurrection with Jesus as the first fruits. Then all of us, would follow at the end of the age. Now look at uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. You as a Christian, this is the power of the cross of Jesus. And, And this is why we need to continually experience the cross in our life. We need to allow the Spirit of God to continually put to death the things in our flesh that are not of God. That is the power of the cross. We need that. If Listen, just like what Paul just said, if that doesn't happen, if the work of the cross is not an ongoing reality, then the life of Jesus cannot be revealed. Because as this jar of clay is crushed and kicked around and marred, something begins to happen. The glory that's inside starts to shine out. Now watch this. Look, look what happens. That This is... This is towards the end of, 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 this is at the end of the age now. This is at the end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person, look at this, was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want you to focus your attention on each person was judged according to what he had done. Not according to what, first of all, what they had not done. 
not according to their views and opinions, but according to what they had done. Because you see, that day at the end of the age, and you will all stand there, we will all stand there, if we're not in Christ. Because for the believer, that moment occurs at the moment of faith. Your judgment is done and finalized at the cross. And all of your guilt and shame and all of your sin is transferred. As I would transfer the weight of this Bible from this hand unto that one, God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And it's just so shockingly scandalous and simple that some people say, I just can't believe in that. I can't accept that it's that free, that gracious. But you know what? It is. It is. The cross of Jesus Christ is an inbreaking reality. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was an ahead of, ahead of time reality. You know, when remember the, the time when Jesus was ministering and, and, and uh, he began casting demons out and he approached one person that was demon-possessed to set them free and the demon spoke out? Remember what the demon said to him? At that point he said, Why are you here? He recognized that he was the Son of God. And he said to him, he said, the demon spoke to Jesus and said, you have come before the appointed time. Before the appointed time. You see, in Christ, when Jesus came, he came as the king, ushering in the kingdom of God. And in Christ, the kingdom of God was inaugurated, it was begun, and it will be consummated at the end of the age when he returns, and God will place all, of, all things under his feet. What is so important about the resurrection? Did I even read those verses in 2 Corinthians? Death is at work in us, but life at work in you. What is so important about the resurrection? Wasn't the cross cross of Jesus a finished work? Yes, it was. You know, I I remember when I was taught early on how to share with somebody about Jesus, I, I memorized the Roman road, you know, these verses in Romans. And there's all, there was mention of the cross and forgiveness of sins and, and justification and righteousness and so forth. But I don't recall ever talking about the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Didn't Jesus pay it all at Calvary? Didn't he cover all of our debt? What else could we possibly need? We need the power of the resurrection. You see, it's not an either-or proposition like our friend... In, on the internet, on YouTube, was thinking. We need the crucified life and the resurrected life. It's a both and proposition. That's how Jews thought. That's how we should think. Jews had no problem holding those two things together. We are bearing the cross and we're, and we're also experiencing the power of the resurrection. I want to say just a few things about the resurrection. And what I have to say, I... I Borrowed some of this from a, a very smart guy named Daniel Kirk of, of Fuller, professor of Fuller. Don't let your eyes gloss over just because I mentioned professor and because I mentioned a seminary. Uh, but he had some really good things to say about the resurrection. You see, and this is really material like for about three weeks, but I'm going to try to condense it into one. At his resurrection, Jesus becomes something that he was not before. Jesus becomes something that he was not before. Jesus, at the resurrection, becomes the enthroned king of the world. He becomes the Messiah in full. Now, but you're saying, well, isn't the Jesus that we meet in the Gospels before the resurrection also the Messiah? The answer to that is yes and no. Jesus in the Gospels before the resurrection was like David was in 1 Samuel when he is anointed by the prophet Samuel. But David was anointed when he was about between 12 and 15 years of age as a young shepherd. He is anointed as king and so that was the inauguration of his reign. But his reign was not consummated until 2 Samuel about 2 Samuel 5 or 6, when he is first named king of Judah and then made king over all of Israel, 
when he takes control of the kingdoms of Judah. You see, the things that we see pictured in the life of David, that's why the life of David bears deep study and reflection. Because the things that we see in the life of David are the very things, and it causes us to understand the ministry of Jesus Christ even more. So, what happens with Jesus? Samuel anoints the young shepherd king, and all kinds of interesting things begin to happen in David's life. He defeats Goliath. You know, he rallies the 400. He, he, he wins great battles. He causes, you know, Saul to flee, spare Saul's life. God is at work in his life. Now, when was Jesus anointed king in his earthly ministry? That anointing occurred when the forerunner, when the one who came in the spirit of Elijah... John the Baptist baptizes him at the Jordan. You see, that baptism for Jesus was not a baptism of repentance. He didn't need to repent. When John saw him, he said, I'm not worthy. You need to baptize me. And Jesus said, let it be done so that all righteousness would be fulfilled. And so what happens? John baptizes him, and Jesus obediently receives the baptism from John the Baptist. And then immediately a voice from heaven cries out and is heard by those who were were there And the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then what happens? God baptizes him with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God comes down and rests in power on Jesus. That's the inauguration of his ministry. What happens after that, immediately immediately after that? Jesus goes into the desert and the enemy comes, Satan comes to tempt him. There's a parallel between what happens in David's life following the anointing and what, Jesus, what happens with Jesus in that desert experience. It's really re- quite remarkable. But Jesus resists him with the word of God and he overcomes the enemy. I don't want to go too far into this, but listen, here's the deal. In a nutshell, in the Gospels, Jesus inaugurates the new reign of God and he deals a death blow to the imposter king through his death on the cross. The cross was the death blow to Satan. He didn't see it coming. So the cross is the defeat of the old king, and the resurrection is the enthronement of the new. Jesus was enthroned at the resurrection. In fact, if you look at Romans with me, something else really remarkable happens, and that enthronement, is, is vital. You see, all of these things that Jesus experiences are, are at work realities. They're, they're things that we are, we are benefiting from now and will benefit from in fullness when he returns. Look at Romans uh, chapter, chapter 4. I, I don't think I gave you that verse, Reuben. I'm not sure. Um, chapter 4, verse 25. He was delivered over to what? To death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was delivered over. He was delivered over to death for our sins, not for his own. And he was raised to life for our justification. What does that mean, justification? Now remember when Jesus was being tried, he was mocked, he was vilified. They made fun of him. They said, if you're the king of the Jews, you know, they they put a a crown of thorns on him. They took a a robe and they mocked him. They made fun of the fact that he had claimed that he was was a king. He was a king because he was bringing the kingdom of God. But they mocked him for it. Remember when he hung on the cross? You know, they said, if you're really a king, if you're really the son of God, come down from the cross. Now what happens at the resurrection At the resurrection, as God enthrones his son, Jesus is justified. All of the vilifications, all of the things that were spoken against him are now shown to be true. And so God justifies him. He justifies Jesus Christ. And because Jesus is justified, meaning that God said he's the real thing, he's my son, and I'm going to prove it by raising him from the dead. Because of that justification... 
And because God declared him to be the righteous son of God, and because he is worthy to rule, God raised him from the dead and put him above every name, so at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on heaven and below and on earth and below the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior to the glory of the Father. I want to say this to you. You either recognize that on this life or you will recognize it in the next. And not because I say so. Not because I say so, but because it is true. Jesus is Lord. Now, because Jesus is justified, we can be justified. What does it mean to be justified? This is a wonderful truth. The resurrection, the power of the resurrection justifies me. It means that before the court of heaven, I have been declared righteous, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so as I put my faith in Jesus, God declares me to have a right standing before the court of heaven. And so before the court of heaven, I am justified as innocent, considered and reckoned as innocent because of the resurrection of Jesus. I want to tell you some really good news. That's good news. But I want to tell you some more good news. And I want to finish with this. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees our future resurrection. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith in him, I'm not talking about being a churchgoer. I'm not talking about being a religious person. If you are trusting in Jesus, if you have come to the cross of Calvary and you have confessed that he is your Lord and Savior and you have received him, the fact that he rose is the guarantee that you will also be raised. It means also that our present lives already bear signs of the future. The resurrection reality, what we will become, is already beginning to happen now. We're already experiencing that. 1 Corinthians and 15. Jesus was the first fruits, rather, and the forerunner. And I want to talk about that resurrection specifically. What, it, what does this mean to you and me that he rose? What are the implications of him being the first fruits? Meaning, the first fruits is the first part of the harvest. The first part of the harvest is gathered at, at the feast of, of weeks, the first fruits. That is a, a down payment of the future harvest. And so Jesus is the first part of the harvest. The harvest is already there. See, it's a reality. It's already beginning to happen. Jesus is proof of that. The fact that there's a first part of the harvest means that there's a second part of the harvest which will be gathered. That's the rest of the righteous that will be raised incorruptible at the second coming, at the rapture event. What are the implications for you and me? Colossians 3.3 3 says this, You died... For you died, there's the the experience again of the cross. Past tense, you died, and now your life is what? Is hidden with Christ. Where is my life? My life is hidden with Christ. I have died. You see, the only way to take a hold of God's promises for the future is to take a hold of the living, resurrected Christ right now because he is holding my life. I have died. See, that's the the reality that we need to wake up to. I can experience the power of the fullness of what's going to be mine in the future at the age to come when I stand. You know, Job, we were singing that song earlier. Job, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will reign on the earth. And then he said, and after... My skin worms have destroyed this body, the natural body, yet with my eyes will I see God. How on earth is that going to happen? Well, Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians. If you look to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 35, 
1 Corinthians 15, 35. Reuben, that's also an addition there. Someone may ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. This is foolishness. This idea is foolishness to those who are perishing. When Paul went to, to Athens and he stood at the Aerogophagus, which is the place where the, all of the philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics, the great men of wisdom of, of that age, were gathered. They called, they called Paul a fool. They called him, the Greek word they used was a spermologus. You're a spermologus. You're lower than, than low. You're a fool to believe that, Paul. Verse 36, how foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of weed or something else. Verse 38. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives it his own body. All flesh is not the same. All flesh is not the same. Notice that. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor, notice this, of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly body is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the stars differ, stars differ from stars in splendor. Look at verse 42. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now that natural body is the jar of clay that Paul was talking about. Now look what he says here. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The last Adam being Jesus Christ. Adam had a natural body. Jesus Christ lived in this life, in this world, in a natural body, but he was raised incorruptible by the Holy Spirit and he reigns today and he lives and he is in heaven in bodily form but in a spiritual body. Now listen, the fact that it's called a spiritual body doesn't mean that you cannot touch it and you cannot feel it and that it can't sense and enjoy. In fact, that spiritual body is described and we see it in the Gospels because Jesus appears to, to, um, to Thomas and Thomas touched him and he felt and the, the marks of the wounds were still there. And in Luke, in, in Luke 24, when he's walking, the disciples are along the road to Emmaus. He appears to them. And at first, they didn't recognize him, see, because there's something slightly different about this spiritual body. It's similar to the natural body, but it's different. The natural body is ruled by the emotions and the soul. The spiritual body is ruled by the, will be ruled completely by the Spirit. Verse 46. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are also those of the earth. And as was the man from heaven, I'm in verse 48, so are those who are, who are of heaven. And just as we, are bo- we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where, O death, is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, we're not just talking about Jesus' own experience and what he is now, but we're also talking about our future and the ways in which the future is breaking into the world in which we now live. Did you know that? We're not heading into the future. The future is breaking into us. The kingdom of God is the future. The kingdom of God is a coming kingdom. It's a rain which is coming, and it's breaking in. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And he will restore all things. This is good news. Now, the resurrected Christ, with all of the authority that is his, said to his disciples in the Great Commission, after he rose from the dead, he said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. And so he said, so go, go. And that sending is a sending that reverberates through time, through the centuries, right down to here today. And Jesus, when Jesus sends you, he sends you not with your authority, not with your ability, thank God, not with your power, not with mine, but with his authority and his power to go and complete the mission that he began. This is a story, not only of forgiveness, but also a power of transformation, of hope. Flannery O'Connor was an American writer in the 20th century. Brilliant writer. She died fairly young in her life. She died of lupus. She wrote a lot of wonderful stories, great short stories. One of them she wrote was called A Good Man is Hard to Find. And in it she spoke of this misfit. This misfit. And the misfit is speaking and explaining at one point in the story the earth-shattering significance of Jesus' resurrection. And these are the words from the story. The misfit says, He, Jesus, has thrown everything off balance. He's thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then there remains nothing for you to do but to throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't do it, then there's nothing else to do but to take these few minutes that we have left and enjoy them the best way that we can. If Jesus is risen, and if he is seated at the right hand of power, and if he has the right to rule and reign, all that remains is for us to bow our knee before him, and surrender everything that we are and everything that we have to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, the behavior of other Christians is a false argument to reject the authority and the holiness and the purity of Jesus Christ. That is a fallacy that if you took a course in philosophy, you would learn right away. The fact that other Christians, and many Christians, in fact, even I don't live up to everything that Jesus said and did. Is no reason why anybody should reject the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of the resurrection. Philosophers call that an argument ad hominem, an argument against the man. But I can argue against the man, but it doesn't take away the truth of Jesus Christ. And through the centuries, people have looked at the Gospels, the most brilliant men who have lived, and have said, as they have read it, 